Have you ever been deposed? A deposition. I have. Several times. Not recently. Thankfully. A deposition, in my humble opinion, on the outside looking in, is like one of the worst job interviews you've ever been through. You go in in a good state of mind and you are opposite a usually a usual savvy attorney who is prepared a list of questions that you need to answer honestly truthfully so he can put together whatever he needs to put together sometimes the que- and then the questions start slow and easy state your name etc cetera, etc cetera. and then you get into some other questions one they don't like it when you are glib or attempt to be humorous or get the one up on them. One question in one deposition was if I, if I was involved in any uh, clubs, societies, or organizations. And I remember uh, listing the clubs and societies and organizations I was in. And the attorney said to me, are there any others that you might be forgetting? And I said, yes, I was a member of the Columbia Records and Tapes Club for four years, but that ended badly. (laughs) Didn't care for that. Uh, Who wins in a deposition? In my humble opinion, once again, I think it's like a chess match. Whoever cracks first, whoever gets mad first. Uh, In the most recent deposition I had, I seem to have gotten under the skin of the attorney who was sitting across from me. Why am I talking about depositions? Well, first of all, let me say this. Hi, my name is Dino Tripodis, and this is a very special edition of Whiskey Business, the podcast not so much about whiskey as it is one with whiskey. The guest bottle tonight is something that you're not, you, you, you might see Russell's Reserve single barrel in the stores, but not this particular bottle because this was a special uh, barrel that was made just for the Columbus Italian Club. So we are drinking, so we've had Russell's on the show before, but not the single barrel, so that's what we'll be drinking tonight. And it's potent, it's 110 proof, okay? That is the guest bottle. Our guest tonight is me, because we're turning the tables tonight. My neighbor, probably one of the best neighbors that anybody could ever have for the last 17 plus years, is attorney Bill Mattis, who is a partner at Dinsmore and Shoal. And he came up with the idea, I'd like to interview you. I have some questions. He said he had dissected it into three parts. And I said, you know what? That could be fun. So tonight's episode, we're calling it the Whiskey Business Deposition. As we introduce our guest, sort of, kind of, I'm the guest, but you are the interviewer, Bill Mattis. Thank you so much for being with us. And, And I meant what I said. You are a great neighbor. Thank you for having me. Close to the microphone, please. We'll get to get to the microphone. I don't have a problem with my voice. I I understand. So, um, there are no real rules except that you are to interview me and I cannot interview you. Okay. And that's going to be kind of hard for me, but I'll do my best. All right. Let's start in the beginning. In the Uh, beginning. I promise, first of all, to tell the proof, the whole proof, and nothing but the the proof. proof. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Be- before we get into your background, Dino, yes. uh, let's let's talk a minute about the concept of footprints. Uh, as you mentioned, you moved in about 17 years ago. And you regularly mentioned my daughters, my wife, my prior dog, current dog. Um, in your show, in your stand-up routines, and you told me that it was all about footprints. And I wonder if you could explain to your audience what you mean by footprints. The footprints that we make or the footprints that we leave? The footprints that you leave when referring to others in your business. What do I mean by footprints? I think personally what I mean by footprints is that um, I like to think that um, in whatever I do and whatever I've done, I've left uh, good footprints career-wise, socially, uh, intellectually, um, personally. I also know that uh, I probably, through uh, good times and bad times, have maybe have not left the best of footprints behind. Footprints that I wish I could go back and, and you know, erase like you do in the sand. Uh, but um, 
I, I, are you asking me to, how do I think those footprints have affected others? No, I'm asking you for the definition of footprints in the vein of you interviewing people, you being on radio, you writing books, you using your talents. Yeah. You once commented to me that everything was about footprints, leaving Foot- them for people to see. Yes, yes. I hope to leave behind when it's all said and done and I'm in the ground. Well, actually, I'm not going to be in the ground. I... I uh, I plan on being cremated. My mother will never see this because she would object terribly because uh, Greeks are not supposed to be cremated. It's against the the policy of the, the church, whatever the case might be. But yeah, I'm not going in the ground. I'm cremated and put into a antique Jack Daniels bottle. <laughs> 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 and if there's too many, if there's if there's too much ash to fit in the bottle, what I wanted to do was get them uh, get some of those little airplane Jack Daniels bottles, then people could take a little bit of me home with them. How's that for a footprint? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, my plan was to leave behind, I think everybody wants to leave something behind, uh, for lack of a better word, call it a legacy. Uh, and, and legacies don't have to be large, great, or grand, they just have to have significance. So I hope that my footprints that I leave behind, creatively, personally, socially, um, you know, are remembered. So that's 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 what I kind of mean by footprints. I want to leave something behind. Okay. So where did your footprints start? Where were you born? I was born in Gary, Indiana for about lived there for about 2 or 3 years, I think, before we moved to a suburb in Chicago, Dalton, Illinois. I did not think that Gary, Indiana and where we lived was significant until Michael Jackson died. And when Michael Jackson died, and they were showing pictures of his home in Gary, Indiana, and I'd spoken to my mother, oh, too bad about Michael Jackson. She said to me for the first time ever, oh yeah, that was about a block and a half away from where we used to live. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck? We lived a block and a half away from the Jacksons? Are you kidding me? You know, and I started to wonder, like if we would have stayed in Gary, Indiana for any length of time, would I have been friends with Michael Jackson? Would I have been, would it, would it have been the Jackson Six? <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, you know, would, would would my mom have been friends with Mrs. Jackson? Uh, would 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 my father have hung out with Joe? Ugh, I don't know. These these are things. These are all the what? I go. Well, why didn't you ever tell me that? She goes, Oh, I never thought it was important. But then I find out that we lived a block and a half away from the Jacksons. Then we moved to Dalton, Illinois, suburb of Chicago, South Side. And how long were you on the South Side of Chicago? Uh, until I was nine years of age nine years of age where my father uh, announced um, one summer that we were packing it all up and moving to Greece. Not just Greece, an island in Greece, Ikaria, Ikaria, where my father and all of his relatives were from. We were moving to Greece. We were gonna live in Athens uh, during the school year, but uh, that summer, that first drop, if you will, was uh, in Ikaria, uh, living in my Uncle Alex's house. Um, yeah, that was, uh, that was quite the culture shock. Now, was Stamey born at the time? Stamey was born at the time. Stamey, I was nine. Stamey would have been four or five. Who's your sister? My sister, yes, okay. my younger sister. Okay. And did you speak the language at that time? Yes, we were kind of immersed into the, the Greek language. It's like... Uh, if, like any family, if they speak Spanish or Chinese, whatever the case might be, if it's spoken in the house, which it was a lot, you kind of get immersed into it and, and just kind of naturally learn how to speak the language. So, yeah, we all spoke it. Okay. And how long did you spend in Greece? <sighs> I was in Greece. I personally was in Greece for, for two years. The rest of my family stayed longer. What happened with you? Where'd your footprints take you? The first year that we were in, when the fall rolled around, um, I was gonna go to the American Community Schools in Athens. My mother was in line to get a job with the US Embassy as a secretary. I don't know what the job would have been, just something, you know, uh, something office related. She did not get the job. If she would have gotten the job, the tuition at the American Community School would have been deferred or free. She didn't get the job, so we had to pay the tuition, which I assume uh, from my father's reaction was steep. So I went to, uh, I was in the, in the fourth grade at that time. 
yeah, fourth grade? Yeah, fourth grade. And I went there one year. When the next school year came around, my father told my mother that uh, he was not going to pay the tuition for me to go to that school and that I could go to Greek school. If I was gonna go to Greek school, I would have had to have started in the first grade. When I should have been going into the fifth grade, I would have had to have started scholastically. Even though I could speak it, I didn't know how to write it or read it. I would have had to have started in the first grade. My mother, one of the few times that she actually stood up to my father back then, adamantly said, um, I'll send him back to the States first before I let you do that. And my father um, coldly stated, go ahead. It wasn't the best relationship. Uh, so yeah, before that uh, summer was over, the plans were for me to leave the island, and I did. Um, I left my parents, my sister, and other family members behind on the island. I took a boat from Icaria with uh, a friend of the family. It wasn't even, uh, I didn't even have my family come to Athens with me. A friend of the family got me to Athens safely and put me on a plane and I flew at what would have been, what now, 11 years of age. I flew from Athens uh, to New York. My uncle Steve Stelio picked me up in New York City drove me to Steubenville, Ohio, and um, I started the fifth grade at Grant Elementary uh, about two weeks, two weeks late, two or three weeks into the school year. It would have been 1970, 1971? Yeah, because I started high school in 1974, was that right? 73, 74, graduated in 77, but yeah, I did fifth and sixth grade and junior high school at Grant Elementary and junior high. Yeah. Now, growing up in Steubenville, it's very similar to where I grew up in eastern Pennsylvania, a coal, steel-driven town. Um, what were your impressions of the people that you were surrounded by in that town in the early 70s? Growing up, I, I, I think, I, I always say, I always call Steubenville my, even though I was born in Gary and, and spent some time in, in Chicago, I, I always call Steubenville my, home time, my hometown because I think those were my formative years. Um, uh, I started going to the Greek church and met a lot of Greek friends. Um, I lived with my grandmother, my grandfather, and my uncle Chris uh, under them under that roof for the next. It wasn't. It wasn't until I was almost fourteen years old, uh, thirteen or fourteen, about two years before my mother and my sister finally came over from Greece. My my parents' marriage. Uh, continued to disintegrate, and my mother and my sister came into uh, Steubenville. My impression was it was a, at that time uh, everything was thriving. You know, Steubenville was a thriving downtown. Some of my best memories were going downtown on a Saturday uh, afternoon with my grandfather. You know, um, and there were five and dimes and movie theaters and stores. There was a, there was a three floor department store called the Hub. There were clothing stores and shoe stores and pharmacies and bars and restaurants. I mean, it was it was a great, great town at that particular time in the 70s before, you know, the steel industry started to take a hit. And when that started to happen, you know, uh, Steubenville started to go down. I remember when the Fort Steuben Mall was built and opened up and everybody said that would be one of the, the death bells of downtown because people would start going to the mall. But even then, you know, it was just another place to go. Steubenville downtown was still thriving. Um, yeah, really, really good memories of, of growing up. You know, I started to go to church on a regular basis. I became an altar boy uh, and uh, got involved in the, the various youth groups that the church had to offer. Uh, Greek Orthodox Youth of America, the Junior Goya. Yeah, that's G O I A. Um, an altar boy. Who'd have thunk it? I was an altar boy. Yeah, yeah, I was an altar boy, and I was in the choir. I had a magnificent, I had a magnificent first tenor voice as a child. It was so pure. I don't know what ruined it. <laughs> You're lighting a cigarette. When did you pick up smoking in Steubenville? I started smoking in Steubenville. I was my first cigarette were menthols. 
because that was the cool thing to smoke, either Salem's or Cool's. <laughs> and it was something uh, that, you know, we started to do, but I didn't do it on a regular basis. We would only do it, we had this, uh, Ron Parisi had carved out this little, um, for lack of a better word, a cave, almost, like in, in the woods. And in that cave, it was, it was pretty spacious. It was about the size of this room, actually. And in there, uh, we had, you know, uh, beer stashed and Playboys and cigarettes and, and uh, uh, an AM radio with batteries. And it would just be like this, this, this cool little hangout that we would go and, and smoke and, and hang out and hide in from time to time. Um, and what is it about boys that, that no matter where you grow up, you all have a cave and we all hang out and smoke cigarettes and I don't know, man. I think that's just have magazines to look at and such. Yeah, the magazines belong to Bill Knoll. He had, <laughs> he had and, and I think even I, I may be wrong. Uh, this might just be part of the myth and mythology, but I think he actually had the presence of mind to get a post office box. And, and have them delivered as a teenager, and, and, as a teenager, and have them delivered <laughs> to the post office box, so so he could get them there. And how he got, I don't know how old you have to be to get a post office box. I don't know how he, made, but he that I just remember that he and he he treasured them. I mean, you know, it's like you know, if you if you looked at them, you had to you had to look at them carefully. You couldn't crease the pages. Yeah, yeah, you had to. Uh, it was it was. Uh, it was crazy, man. You just you just had to just you know follow the Bill Knoll rules in respects to uh, reading the Playboys. But yeah, I, I didn't smoke that much in high school. Um, I started smoking a little bit more, even. But then again, it was socially in college. Uh, only when I was drinking. When I really started smoking on a regular basis was probably when I started doing stand up. Is when I started to smoke. Uh, I would consider myself to have become the uh, addicted smoker that I am today. It went from casual to just something that, you know, became... Have you ever quit? I've quit. Didn't you do hypnosis at one point? I, hypnosis did not work. I'm, I'm, uh, it's, uh, Too strong-willed? That's, that's what he said. <laughs> that's what he said. I, went, I, could not, I, could not, uh, I could not buy into it. I tried the hypnosis. I tried acupuncture to quit smoking. I went cold turkey. Cold turkey's probably been the best, the best I've ever done. You know, um, it's the only thing that ever worked for me. Yeah, it's. Uh, I went. I think I went six months, one time without smoking, and uh, I remember, I, 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 it was stupid at, at the time. Uh, the person I was seeing was a vegetarian, and uh, uh, so I went vegetarian. I didn't eat meat, and I didn't smoke, and I had. Uh, I was trying to also, you know, just be a social you know just drink whenever there was an occasion to drink not drink just to drink you know whatever the case might be and then on my birthday one year i just fell off the wagon hard i went into the blue danube and uh was that one of the birthdays when you used to get a van or a bus to come out front of Indian Springs Drive and take you and all Oh no, your this friends? is long before Indian Springs okay. Drive. This is this was this was this is when I was uh, living it living in a in a uh, uh, small apartment above the Clintonville Hardware on High Street over thirty three eleven and a half North High Street. That's okay. where I lived there, and so yeah, you know, like two hundred forty five bucks a month. It was the first apartment I actually got when I got divorced. So it was early then, but I remember walking into the Blue Danube, and you know, I think it's my birthday. I'm gonna have a drink, and you know, I had a drink, and then I said, uh, "Fuck it," and I I had a double bacon cheeseburger and French fries with beef gravy, and then I bought a pack of cigarettes because they were actually selling cigarettes behind the bar at that time, and you could smoke in the bars at yes, that time. Yes, you could. It was a good place so to smoke. So I was just. I was just completely indulged in, in 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 meat and smoke and whiskey, and I remember uh, coming home <laughs> that day and uh, <laughs> she 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 smelled me <laughs> she, like 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 a woman would smell uh, a, a man who had had just had a tryst with another woman. That type of you know that type of sniff like have you been with another woman and she 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 smelled me she did you eat meat did you eat meat 
And then she said, and did you smoke? And uh, oh yeah, I just yeah, boom. I just I did it all. Yes, I ate meat. I smoked a cigarette. I drank whiskey. I just I'm a horrible person. I've never been happier. <laughs> Oh, those are some footprints. Let's take your feet back to Steubenville. Tell me about uh, Bill. You mentioned him a couple times. Who? Bill, Bill Noel. Oh, Bill Noel. Yeah. We don't know where Bill is. We don't know where he is? No. Bill, we, we, were, all, we were all roommates in college together. It was uh, Greg DeTore, Dave Kaplan, Bill Noel, and myself. I was the last one to join the group because I wasn't sure I was even going to go to college because I had gotten a job in the steel mill that summer and was making pretty good bank. You know, and then they put me in the blast furnace for two weeks, and I said, oh, "Well, I'm done with the mill." <laughs> and I decided to to go, and I still had a chance to join up with the boys. So it was, a, but but um, the three of us, David, Greg, and myself, stayed pretty close and have stayed close throughout the years. Bill got upset with us, and I, you know, looking back, he should have. We we <laughs> we we. we, we <laughs> We were brutal. We were brutal. I mean, we were we were brutal to each other, but we might have been a little extra brutal on Noel. And I don't know why, because he was a great guy. He, he was the, the guy that got you your Playboys and your cigarettes. He was the coolest. He had the coolest car. He had the coolest car. He had. Uh, he what had do you a, have? He had a Grand Torino, uh, a, a brand new Grand Torino. It was a uh, oh yeah, it was yellow with a white stripe. Yeah. I mean, it was awesome, and he had the the best the best speaker system in the car. I mean, it was yeah yeah just so. But uh, yeah, we 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 were pretty brutal. Is he still in Steubenville? No 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 no, no. After we got out of college, he moved out. He moved out of the dorm uh, this the, that year, that first year even, and went someplace else. And then we just uh, lost contact. It was like five or six years ago i i don't know if it was an email and he was like is this gus because you know gus james dino Trapeza, and we we started to have contact a little bit and then it faded away again um so we all come up with our own versions of what he was very smart he was, he was a very smart guy uh so i'm sure wherever wherever bill Knoll is he's doing very well and if somehow he stumbles across this podcast i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> and come to Clintonville, Bill. You'll yeah. have fun. Well, let's talk about your influences growing up. Um, I've heard stories of a teacher that was a big influence in your life. Um, who was that? That teacher? would be that would be Mr. Haskins. Mr. Haskins was my English teacher and my composition teacher. In what grades? In high school. In high school, uh, probably uh, sophomore, junior year of high school. Yeah, if I recall correctly. Yeah, Mr. Haskins. Great teacher. Why was he such a big influence in your life? Um, first of all, he was a he was a just a good teacher. He was he, he knew how to he knew how to talk to the students. Um, he he ran his class very with a firm hand, you know. He wasn't like he wasn't trying to be everybody's best friend, but he had a um, a sincere love of teaching for starters and um it was his english class that i had and also his composition class where we had to write comp compositions on on various things whatever the subject matter might have been and um i remember he said one day in class he goes i don't usually read any of these compositions out loud but this one just captured my my fancy, the imagination of it, and I could see the characters in it. He goes, the mechanics are deplorable, <laughs> but those can be fixed. And then he said, I'd like to read this one out loud to, 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 to give you an example of how you should foster your imagination and try to put it on paper. And while he's blah, 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 and, I'm in the back of the room, you know, I never sat up front. I'm in the back of the room going like, who's the suck up who wrote this essay? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then he reads my my uh, my composition because the, uh, the topic was uh, fantasy. And <laughs> it was, my, my composition was about Frank Sinatra being a fairy godfather. This, Sinatra was still alive. At Sinatra time. was still alive, of course. Yes, Sinatra was a fairy godfather, who would uh, 
who would grant you know three wishes to this to this kid and uh if i remember the do you still have the piece no no i don't i wish i did um but i remember that uh, the kid the kid messes up the third wish you know and the lesson is you know be careful what you wish for but but when frank said at the end of it he goes hey kid you got two out of three <laughs> <laughs> That's a good day. That's a good That's day. That's a good day. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm. It'll get you to, in the Hall of Fame in baseball. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to, re, I'm trying to capture it. Uh, and then he, he read that one, and he, then later on, in, 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 in the school year, he read another one that I had wrote about a, a friend of mine who was, uh, who had, uh, it was either, he either had cancer or leukemia, or some type of lymphoma, and he was like this, like the sweetest guy in the world. And the composition consisted of, uh, of just my, my questioning, my why, why, why him, why somebody so young and, and so nice and so good, why does an ugly disease like that uh, have to infiltrate a person like, like him? I, I wasn't saying it should infiltrate somebody bad, but I didn't understand the randomness of it. And apparently I managed to express that rather eloquently my sophomore junior year and, and he read that one out loud and, 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 and he gave me he, he, he gave me the belief that I could write you know he said I don't care what you do what you wind up doing in this world but don't stop writing and please fix your mechanics because they're <laughs> deplorable and they still are <laughs> deplorable to this day but as far as the you know uh giving somebody the i for lack of a better word permission to to be creative and 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 just to give you that that faith that little boost somebody to believe in you at that age and, and something like that was very important to me and very significant and i remember when we had teacher appreciation week on the radio station uh, years ago we actually I, I talked about mr haskins and we actually located him he had retired but uh, and got him on the phone, and he remembered, you know, reading those essays. And God damn it, he also said, "And your mechanics were deplorable." <laughs> <laughs> but he's he's a great man. He's still with us. He's uh, he's um, re retired, and um, his son-in-law is a member of the Columbus Italian Club. His son-in-law married uh, one of his daughters, and. Uh, he he's living it's normally in, the way it happens with son-in-laws. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. But he's living in a in a in a, an assisted living uh, home in in Texas. He's uh, well into his eighties, but he's he's still he's still kicking. So, w what kind of kid were you in high school back in the seventies? There were the the jocks, the heads, the boozers, the nerds, the band people. Yeah, I hung out with the nerds and the band people. Greg Detori was a drummer in the band. Uh, and I hung out with Greg Dettori, Dave Kaplan, and Ron Parisi. Uh, in high school? In high school. Oh, yeah, we, 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 we go way back. Um, I used my sense of humor. My sense of humor. I, was, I, was, I, was, I didn't have a, a steady girlfriend in high school. Uh, I was that guy that all the girls thought was really cute and nice, and so I love Gus, but I don't want to date him. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, how large of a Greek population was there in Steubenville growing up? Steubenville was a melting pot of ethnicity. There were Greeks, Italians, Polish people, Russians. I mean, there was a lot. There was a there was a good sized Greek community in church. We have a beautiful church in Steubenville, Ohio. And they all came in for work in the steel and I think back spin in the off day, jobs. Yeah, yeah, they all came and worked in the mill. A lot of them did, and a lot of them, you know, went off on their own and did other things, grocery stores and and other businesses. But yeah, there was a, there was a thriving Greek community. But I didn't hang out with. I had Greek friends, Spiro Alexander ended up being one of our roommates i grew up with spiro and uh uh you know all the all the guys i knew from from church we were all friends uh you know, tony majanis was a year ahead of me so he grad he was one year ahead of me but pd vasilaris i mean yeah we all hung out and had a, had a great time together but i was the i was the humorous guy i used my sense of humor and maybe it was my early start in radio who knew but one of the reasons i got to be uh known for my humor was I did the morning announcements on the PA system, and I would do <laughs> testing one two three testing one two three. But I this would is do, Gus. I would know, but I but that's the thing. I would do even then. I developed that that sense of 
timing because <laughs> I would do like one real announcement. You were doing the morning show in high school. I would do one real <laughs> announcement, two real announcements, and the third one would be totally made up and, uh, and just ridiculously funny. And then, you know, I'd go in and one, two, three. And, and, and the principal, um, uh, Mr. Watkins, Mean Gene, Mean Gene Watkins, that's what they called him. And he wasn't that mean, but he, you know, you didn't want to mess with him either. Uh, he loved it. I mean, he 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 thought it was the greatest thing ever, uh, and so I did the the morning announcements, and people would actually, you know, listen to them because they were waiting to hear what I would come up with, you know, uh, on a daily basis. So yeah, I was I was I was writing shtick, you know, in high school. Were you in the AV club? We didn't have an AV club. Okay. I was, uh, when I look back at my yearbook, apparently I was in the chess club. <laughs> I think I might have been in the Spanish club, you know, which... For extra credit. Yeah, for extra <laughs> credit. Um, I was in the key club, which was a high school version of the Kiwanis organization. Okay. Um, yeah, wasn't a jock. I tried to be. Steubenville, good in sports in the 70s when you were in high school? Oh, hell yeah. Big Steven, Red was Steven, uh, Steubenville was good. Steubenville was a good in basketball, football. Yeah, we were we were feared even back then. The the Big Red Machine, absolutely. I didn't try to play football. I did try to play basketball early on. Um, when I first moved to Steubenville, uh, I uh, we would have ba intramural basketball at at school, and um, for some reason, don't ask me why. I never played basketball in my entire life, but I had this, this what would have been considered now a three-pointer. It wasn't a three-pointer back then, but I could shoot from outside the key and it would go in like almost all the time, especially from the side. So uh, the coach who also was the teacher and so forth, the gym teacher, you know, said you should try out for the basketball team. And my grandmother wouldn't sign the permission slip because she had a hard, fast rule that while I was on her watch, nothing, she wasn't gonna let anything happen to me. She was very, very strict about what I did as far as extracurricular activities. If it didn't involve the church, the library, or going to the movies, or downtown, no, that's it. So me, to go play basketball and run up and down a court, and potentially hurt myself while my mother was in Greece, my grandmother would have no part of it. And she was the only one who could sign a permission slip. So. Sounds like an Italian grandmother. Uh, Greek grandmother. Greek grandmother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, both. Um, but um, yeah, technically both. But uh, she, yeah, she, uh, she would not let me play basketball. So it never happened. Were you in any plays in high school? They stopped the theater department my freshman year. The my freshman year was the last was the last senior class play. They did. Uh, I want to think. I want to say they did Guys and Dolls. I'm not sure. Uh, you couldn't audition as a freshman. It was the senior class play, and that was the last year they had theater. So we didn't get to do any of that. You mentioned your high school yearbook. Have you been following the news the last couple of days? In respects to Mr. Cavanaugh, uh, Mr. Cavanaugh's yeah. high school yearbook and uh, the problems. Are, are, are there any keys in your yearbook that we don't know about? No. No hidden no. messages? No, no, no. There's no hidden messages. Like I said, I had no girlfriend in high school. Um, I had a couple of dates with a, with, a, with, a, with a girl that went to JU, Jefferson Union High School. Um, but she was, she was way prettier than I, of, of a girl that I ever thought I could be. And I, and I, and I pretty much sabotaged that. But, you know... Uh, yeah, there's nothing. No, if you, if I was if I was in the same position as Mr. Kavanaugh right now, you wouldn't be able to go back to, to high school and 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 there wouldn't be any. I never had the opportunity. <laughs> you actually were a virgin in high school. <laughs> no, I was, not, I was not. I was not. That's that's the problem. I think I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but I lost my virginity when I was 14. Okay, in Greece when I went back to visit my father for that, what I thought was gonna be the, the last time. And I remember, you know, my mother was here now and I went back and everybody thought I should go to Greece to see my father. And it wasn't, uh, it, was, it was a good summer for me. It wasn't exactly a bonding summer with my father, but I remember asking him, you know, are you and mom ever gonna get back together? And he said, no. 
and that's when I when I came back from Greece. That's when I took on a different attitude. But I, I digress. But I, I was I met a, a girl from Chicago, ironically enough, who was there for the summer, and um, she she deflowered me, as it, <laughs> as it were, at and the age of fourteen. At the age of fourteen, and then let me tell you, that happens at fourteen, and then you go all through high school <laughs> because you know I expected that. I don't know what my expectation was. I thought that if that was going to happen again, that it would have to be a woman and it would take the lead. And 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 uh, and that didn't happen, you know, because she was older than me. She was like three and a half years. She was almost eighteen uh, years old. And, and isn't there a song? She was almost eighteen. Almost eighteen. She was almost eighteen. I was fourteen. And um, you know, now I'm a freshman in high school, and you know, I expect that's the way it's going to work. Some girl's going to ask me to sleep with her. And and it never happened. And <laughs> <laughs> so, other than uh, Mr. Haskins, uh, who else was a, a large influence in your life? Growing up in Steubenville, grade school through high school. My uncle Chris. Tell me about your uncle Chris. My uncle Chris, and my uncle Bill, who wasn't really an uncle. My uncle Chris, like I mentioned, lived in the house with my grandmother and uh, um, my grandfather. And then eventually he he moved out too and, and went on and everything. But he was just uh, he he was just a protector. Um, uh, I call him Uncle Chris. I guess he, you know he was like a a wonderfully abusive big brother. I mean he's six foot six. You know, he's a big he's man. He's a big man, and uh, uh, he just watched over me and and and, uh you know he he got me in in, involved in in watching football and you know uh the steve you know i became a steeler fan because my uncle chris was a steeler fan i emulated my uncle chris i said you know when i was growing up in those years you know i thought he was the coolest guy in the world and his friends were some of the coolest guys in the world and i said i want to be you know i want to be like uncle chris you know i'd hear stories about their antics and you know some of their their uh, debacles in life that were always hysterically funny, and I'm like, man, I want I want to I want to have friends like that and have stories like that, which I wound up having uh, before it was all in said. spades. <laughs> <laughs> in in, in uh, before it was all said and done, my uncle Chris was 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 one of the influences, and my uncle Bill, Bill Lakios, is uh, um, I I still get sad. You know, he's no longer with us. He was one of the kindest, uh, gentlest men I've ever known. And he probably uh, invoked respect. And, and the way I feel about a lot of things, it, he was like a father that I didn't have. So what, what life lessons did your Uncle Bill teach you as you were going through puberty, coming to grips with becoming a man? Growing up, entering a steel mill, Uncle Bill and realizing that that just was not for you. Uncle Bill believed in all my talents. He believed uh, he taught me respect, how to respect people, how to respect uh, your the things that you have in life. Uh, he was also a, a, a teacher. I never had him in high school. He taught typing in, in high school. Uh, he was just a, a, a gentle, loving man. For a while, he also had a, a restaurant, the, the Broadway Cafe, as well, that uh, he was a part of. So he was a restaurateur. He was a high school teacher um, and just a kind man. He he uh, he was responsible for me getting my first car, the 1967 Pontiac Catalina, the Brown Bomber. Um, he let me use his 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 nice car when I went one of the few dances that I went to um we would uh he was a he was a mason and some of my favorite memories were uh a mason the organized rite of masons or a mason no the 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 organization of masons and he would have his meeting on the same night that I changed the marquee at the grand theater which is one of my side jobs that I did and uh, he would pick me up from there and take me home. And I just remember all these just wonderful chats. His birthday was on January the 1st. And 
Uh, I remember my mother telling me at one point when I was younger, call your Uncle Bill. It's his name day and it's his birthday uh, on January 1st. And I would make this obligatory call to my Uncle Bill, happy birthday. But then it became a thing where I never missed. If I hadn't talked to him for a whole year as an adult, I would call him on January 1st. And uh, he was just a he was just a great man. I mean, I have his picture in there. Okay. okay. I'm not supposed to cry on my own podcast. <laughs> this is a deposition. It's it, it's all about footprints. It's all about where'd you grow up and and who influenced you. As we sit here in this house, can you estimate for me how many first copies of books you have lining your walls? You can't see them, but they're all in this case right here. Um, I don't know how many would you guesstimate are in there, roughly. Thirty-five, forty. Thirty-five or forty first editions. Where'd you get your love for literature and collecting first edition you books? Could, I don't know about collecting first editions. I just, I just know the value of a, of, of a book. Um, not only the words that are in it, but and who wrote it. Um, but the uh, the first editions obviously become special too because they they were the you know the first printings of certain special books. You can credit my grandmother because, like I said, one of the few things she let me do was go to the library and go to the movies. So I was a voracious reader um, once I got to Steubenville. I think I always was as a kid anyway because I was sick when I was a kid, so I read a lot. And But my grandmother let what me... What do you mean you were sick as a kid? Um, I had double pneumonia and a right collapsed lung when I was uh, six years old and when we lived in Dalton. And you smoke. And I said, yeah. And I, I said... It's 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 upright now. It's uh, it's all it's all better, mom. Um, yeah, the double pneumonia and a right collapsed lung, and there was a a point in time where where uh, my mother tells me later in years where, uh, you know, I was I wasn't supposed to make it. I was in Children's Hospital in Chicago in an oxygen tent, and and they had I was not responding to medications. Back to the Michael Jackson thing with the oxygen tent. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, I remember. I got a lot of black holes of things I don't remember, but one of the things I do remember was missing uh, pretty much most of first or second, I think it was second grade, uh, and having a tutor come to the house. And I had so little uh, lung capacity that when and my mother would have to, to need, when I'd cough, she'd have to knead my back in order to bring the phlegm up. So I could, I, you know, why I remember that, I don't know. But that was a, it was a hard time. And according to my mother, uh, you know, I, I, I shouldn't, shouldn't have been here today. But she thought she was going to lose her oldest at a, at a young age. So maybe that was part of it with my grandmother. You know, the fact that I was a sick kid and, and you know, coming back to Steubenville at age 11, I could go to the library. It was almost right across the street from the house. One of the greatest days of my life was, was, was uh, taking my card from the children's library and going upstairs to the main library and getting an adult card at the library. Is this a Carnegie library? Very the, elaborate? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Over, over there on, on uh, South 4th Street. Okay, it's so a you, big day getting my library card upstairs. You, you mentioned a couple males that had a big influence in your life, and, and you've touched on two females um, who I know had a thumbprint on your life. And your grandmother, you yeah, mentioned yeah. library and movies. Could you tell your listeners how many movies you have downstairs on DVD? Uh, over a thousand? Would that be a fair uh, that estimate? Would, that'd be a that fair estimate. That doesn't count the. <laughs> that doesn't count TV shows and box sets of TV shows and and. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of movies down there. And not counting first print, how many other books do you think you have? There's books all through this house. In this house. There's books in this house. Those are the first editions over there. There's books over there with the whiskey. Over there on the, in the back wall, there is a collection of uh, folio editions, which I also love because I just think they're beautiful books and they hold their value and they're, they're not cheap. But um, the, once again, they're, they're, they're editions of, of books and authors that I enjoy and um, I, I hope to leave them to somebody, you know, when I go, whenever that is, 
That'll be one of the footprints that I'll leave behind is those folios. I hope they go to somebody who will appreciate them and, and not sell them off in some garage sale. In fact, I'll probably make that as a stipulation in my in my will. When, when you get around to writing your will that you've been I, working I have, on for I, I five the, or six years I, now? Yeah, I still got, I got the worksheet. I got the <laughs> worksheet. It's a very complicated, it's a very complicated will because there's a lot of things I want to go to certain places and a lot of things that I want done. So it's not your, not your standard will. All right, let, let's... Touch a little bit more on the women in your life um, who appear to have had a strong influence on you. Your grandmother, is she a religious woman? Oh, God. Yes. She made you become an altar boy? Encouraged you to encouraged become an altar boy? Become an altar. I don't know if she encouraged me or told me. <laughs> she may have told me, you're going to be an altar boy. Yeah. And that was through the Greek church? Yeah, the Greek church. I was an altar boy, and then when I was no longer an altar boy, I went into the church choir. Because as I mentioned earlier, I had the voice of an angel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the movies that she let you go to, did, did your grandmother go with you to the movies? She had no idea what movies I was going to. I was allowed to go to the movies. I would go to, oh, I mentioned changing the marquee at the Grand Theater, and I mentioned on an earlier podcast that... I uh, saw Rocky a million times. I, well, I saw Rocky... Uh, you know, yeah, that was 77, so I saw Rocky, yeah, obviously in the theater, but then on campus it was showing for an entire year, my freshman year, Rocky and Star Wars were right next to each other at the University Flick. But I would go to the Capitol Theater, and uh, the Capitol Theater would show current movies. They also, I think the Capitol Theater also started to do like second runs, or, or but you know, I would go see double features. I, I saw, um, you know, uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner and To Serve With Love. It was a Sidney Poitier double feature. Um, and I would see movies like that, and I was just in, in, enthralled with, with films. Plus, on Sundays, uh, movies with my grandfather. There'd be John Wayne Theater and Tarzan Theater every Sunday, and we would watch these John Wayne movies. My grandfather loved John Wayne, and we would watch John Wayne movies every Sunday on John Wayne Theater and the Tarzan movies and old movies, too, uh, that, that came on. Um, so I just developed a love of, of cinema. I remember our field trip uh, going to see... Uh, 2001 a space odyssey was a field trip uh for school and i remember watching this movie and wanting to watch the movie and getting pissed off because it was the all, everybody else was just running around the theater throwing shit at each other and not paying attention to the movie and i'm watching this movie for the first time like ah, you know what was hal's famous line in that movie uh, open the what the 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 doors the, the, I, 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 it was no Bob I can't do that or no what, what's, let, let's take your listeners through how why was oh god don't take why was it that. named how I don't know I don't it know. wanted to be one better than IBM I don't know I don't know why it was named you didn't how. know that I did not know that yeah. I just remember that was my first experience in 2001 how is one one better than IBM hmm well, see that. So let's let's end our first episode here in high first school. First episode, Jesus! I thought we were done. No, we're we're, done. we're only through high school here. Uh, you know, we try to keep this under an hour, so you better you better uh, do some we're, editing. We're, we're, All right, go ahead. We're we're, uh, we're finishing up with high school here. We have uh, started a library at work uh, where people are leaving a book that had the biggest influence in their life. And I want to ask you a three-part question. We'll ask the first one now. If you were to leave a book to a library and put an inscription on it, coming out of high school, coming out of Steubenville, understanding that you were not meant for the steel mill, going to the big city. Oh, wow, man, that's a tough one. What would that book have been coming out of high school? And what would you write in it to leave to the next generation coming up behind you? That is a tough one. Kind of limits you to 1970. Oh, no, no, Three, no, no, four, no. and I earlier. Mean, there were a lot of books that were very popular when I was in high school. Lord of the Rings trilogy was huge. Everybody had the paperbacks. Um, uh, um, those were popular. Gosh. Lord of the Flies was, was a popular book in high school. Um, of Mice and Men. And what would you write? What would your inscription be? 
in that particular book. <laughs> go west, young man. Go west. No, 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 no. That's grapes of wrath. That's grapes of wrath of mice and men. <laughs> Don't play with the rabbits. Don't play with the rabbits. <laughs> uh, no, uh, that 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 of mice and men, John Steinbeck. That's that's probably one of the most word for word one of the most seamless books I've ever read. That just. Uh, and there's there's only a couple books that have made me cry when I've read them, and that was one of them. When when he had to kill his best friend, uh, it just I, I was like shocked and 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 did not see that coming. And uh, I, it's and and it, you know I don't want to. For those of you who have never read it, you need to. But I think the inscription would would be. Uh, to somebody uh, would have to have something about the the depth of a friendship a, a true friendship how deep a friendship can really go you never know until you're truly tested and, and in that particular case I mean he, he I don't want to spoil it but you know anybody that's read My Some Men knows what happens in that book so looking back on your time in Steubenville what was the big holiday was it Christmas was it Easter was it for us Thanksgiving Greek Easter. Thanksgiving. And Easter. Thanksgiving and Easter were the big ones. Thanksgiving and, and Easter would be when, when, when family members would come from New York, you know, and we'd, and we'd set up the big table, you know, in, in the dining room and then extend that table and extend it a little bit more to the kids' table, you know, and, and uh, that, those were the big holidays. Christmas was kind of us, just us, but Thanksgiving and Easter were, were big ones. And my grandmother, I mean, we would have... Uh, ham and lamb and turkey and as amazingly great of a cook as my grandmother was she could never make a turkey the turkey baffled the fuck out of her as far as how to make a turkey but the ham and the lamb and everything else that went along with it was great and uh, my uncle Chris tells a funny story about she felt like she had to have the the cranberry sauce and she 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 bought it at the store, and it came out of a can, and it came out of a can. And it was just you know so gelatinous and just wiggling around. And, and she said in Greek, anything that comes out of a can like that can't be good can't be good to eat. <laughs> <laughs> but Thanksgiving and Easter were the were the big holidays for us. They were they were great. They were grand. Everybody just sleeping everywhere, and just you know my grandmother making pan sized pancakes. I mean they were just one pancake, one cake. That was literally the size of the pan, and yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how she made pancakes. That's the only way she she didn't know how to make silver dollar pancakes. Right. My grandmother would one pancake and boom. I mean, it was that was just yeah. And you had to eat everything. If she put it on your plate, you had to eat it. And that's what never I hated that because she would decide how much would be on your plate, and then you had to finish it. Was there ever any turmoil in Steubenville uh, as you were growing up? Oh my God! Are you kidding me? Race riots, strikes, huh? race oh, the, riots, oh, that, strikes. Oh, oh, are you talking about, I thought you meant personal. No, not personal turmoil. Socially? Social turmoil in, in Steubenville growing up. Um, Yeah, I'm sure there was, but you know what? Um, uh, you talk about racism today, and I'm sure that there were racial divides in Steubenville back in the 70s. Uh, I, I never got involved with any of that. When I went to Grant, school uh and grant elementary and and grant junior high i'd say the ratio of black and white was 80 percent black and 20 percent white so a lot of my friends uh growing up in, in, at that time downtown were, were black uh um and i i never understood there was no i, I never got involved in the difference there was no difference to to me, I mean, Bobby Joe Young was one of my one of my best friends in in grade school. Bobby Joe Young, who went on to become a professional boxer, and uh, um, we actually uh, got in a fight in, in grade school, and he won. <laughs> uh, but after that fight, we became really really good friends, and uh, I remember we did a we had to. We had a play. We had to write something for the school play and something. And we were we were two uh, two drunks, two drunks in an alley, 
uh, talking about life. Uh, this is in the sixth grade, and I wrote it. You know, and we just dressed up like bums and had a an empty bottle, and and uh, I, I remember writing it, and he and I did it. But uh, yeah, there was no there was no division of black or white for me. I never, if there was something that was going on behind me, a swell of whatever. Um, I never, I never, I never had to make a choice because I didn't see there. The, I didn't realize there was any choice to make. Let's uh, finish up with high school. With what happened after you got out of high school? You, you mentioned a steel mill job. Yeah, and I got a job in a steel mill, and my job was I had two jobs until I went to the blast furnace. Uh, the first job, if you want to talk about maybe one, one of the reasons that the that the financially the steel mills uh went down was my job was to for thirteen dollars an hour was to nineteen seventy yeah, two yeah. three wages was to sweep was to sweep yeah that's a lot of money back in the seventies was to sweep from one end of the corridor down to the other. I said okay and when I get done with that he said sweep it back. That was my job. And then I was a coil bander. The the big coil, I had to, that, that, and that paid me more money, where I had to slip a, a band around these steel coils and, and fasten them. And they came at you fast and furious, like about one every 10 minutes. <laughs> so, so, you know, <laughs> and, and I got paid. And then they were like, you know, we, you gotta go to the blast furnace. And I went, okay, more money. But then that was the blast furnace where you couldn't stay in there for more than 20 minutes at a time, you know, because you get so, de you know, and I went, I'm done. <laughs> That's, <laughs> I don't want, I don't want to work in the mill anymore because I was making good money and money was important to me back then. I mentioned before when I came back from Greece at 14 years of age, when my father said he wasn't coming back and my father did not pay child support. He didn't give my mother a nickel. Uh, and I realized that I was gonna be the man of the house at that point. We eventually moved out of my grandmother's house and got our own place, and I started working. I mean, I had already worked that summer. I started working at 13 years of age for a dollar an hour at the at a, uh, a variation of my Uncle Bill's place. His son, Dean, had opened up a little place called the Broadway Cafe, and I had two choices. I could work for a dollar an hour, or I could work for free, and at the end of the summer, get a Chevy Vega. Mm -hmm. I chose the dollar an hour because I needed it. Having owned a Chevy Vega, you made the right choice. Yeah, and I was 13. I, well, what am I going to do with a car I can't drive, you know? Because you work, it only had three cylinders and didn't work, go up hills. Work for free and you get my Chevy Vega or a dollar an hour. I quit that job when I got offered a job at the library for a dollar forty an hour to start. And I worked at the library all through high school and changed and worked here at the Grand Theater. So when you go back, whether it's for the... Dean Martin Festival, or for other gatherings in Steubenville. Now I only go back, it seems like, for sad reasons. You or know, funerals. Yeah. Uh, what do people say about you in Steubenville, Ohio? I don't know. The last time I, I, I made any type of significance, significant appearance in Steubenville was uh, when the church was celebrating an anniversary. And I was doing stand-up comedy at the time, full-time. I wasn't doing any radio. And they asked if I would speak at the uh, anniversary dinner. And there were people that were concerned because I was a stand-up comedian. And would he say things inappropriate? In, in, Seven in, words you can't say yeah, on television. Would say something inappropriate, you know. And I remember opening up, I, I, I put those, those concerns to rest. I said, you know, a lot of people, I said, thank you when they invited me to speak. I went up and I said, uh, a lot of people were concerned because of my stand-up comedy background that I may say something offensive here this evening that might offend some of you. Let me just tell you this. I have the archbishop to my right and our priest to my left. I am in religious checkmate, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> <laughs> which got a big laugh and... Uh, then I just started, you know, telling funny stories about growing up at Steubenville. And it was, it was, and ended up with something very sweet. 
And I also mentioned my Uncle Bill in that speech, as I, as I recall, uh, as far as influences, and, and uh, it, it went well. But people in Steubenville have always been, uh, for lack of a better word, proud. You know, the longer I stayed at the radio station, you know, you're still on the radio. They thought that was a great thing that I was on a radio show and doing the mornings in Columbus, Ohio. And they knew about the stand up. And there was there's my mother recently found uh, an old Steubenville Herald article about me doing stand up that the paper did a whole big feature on, which was kind of cool. And I was at kind of at the height of my stand-up career when things were going it's when i was going to be on fox comic strip live and and so forth and so on so that was kind of a big deal you know you know this it's i don't have a street named after me yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you know the the, the the big names in steubenville still are dean martin uh jimmy the greek and uh for those who uh for those uh porn aficionados tracy lords <laughs> she, she, she was <laughs> she's from steubenville as well Footprints on the ceiling. <laughs> so the footprints you left in Steubenville, um, people still recognize you when you go back? I don't, uh, there's not a lot of, you know, the only people that are back there right now are my Uncle Chris, my aunt. You know, I see, I run into some old friends. So as far as being recognized per se, no. I never I never think I'm going to be recognized anyway. I don't, you know, I was in radio for. Recognized uh, as my high school buddy, my, my grade yeah, school buddy. You know, when, I, when, I, when I've gone to the Dean Martin festivals, those have been sweet reunions. You run into people you haven't seen in a long, long time. Yeah, those have been sweet, you know, and then you start to reminisce. A friend of mine, Rick Andreessen, uh, recently, who has been in charge of our high school reunions for, for you know, every time we go around, recently came up to Columbus and, and uh, you know, we sat and had a few drinks and, and it was great because we talked about, you know, high school days and, 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 and all the stuff that we got into and funny stories, that funny memories and some of the shit that we got away with that we shouldn't have gotten away with in high school. And, you know, that's always fun. But, you know, as far as recognized, eh, I, I don't think so. No, no. Uh-uh. It's a three shift town. Is it still a three shift town? I don't think so. I don't think so. Is there they much got, left? They got they got very excited when uh, fracking got became in vogue, and everybody thought that fracking was going to bring Steubenville back. You know, and there were talks that you know Steubenville would end up being a suburb of Pittsburgh. You know that the fracking would bring the economy back to Steubenville, but. That didn't happen. Dean, as I mentioned when I brought up this idea, I thought it would be nice to split this into two or three parts. Um, I didn't know I, much. I, I thought it was going to be all three parts. I didn't <laughs> think we would go this this uh, in depth. Yeah, well, your listeners and, and most of your friends and anyone who Googles you really doesn't find out much about your early life and the footprints that you left there and the people that affected you and the impression that not only they left on you, but you left on them. <laughs> And, I don't know if I've left impressions on them yet. I'm sure. I don't. I don't think. I don't think you realize. I don't think you know if you leave an impression on somebody until, until much later in life or after you're gone. I mean, I, I, I don't know. Or, or maybe you're just not aware of it. If I have thus far, yay. But I, 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 I still have things to do. No doubt. Yeah. Still more footprints. To, more footprints. More things to talk about. So what you're telling me, Counselor, is that... What I'm telling you is... That we have to wrap it up for now and then continue this conversation at a later date? We'll, we'll backfill with college <sighs> and we'll go into your professional life. But at least now people have a start on where it was and how it was that you got started. Mm. Because it's an interesting story that not many people in America our age can tell. All right. Well, I have told you the whole proof and nothing but the proof. So help you God. <laughs> so help me God. Uh, so uh, thank you, Bill Mattis. My Didn't mean to make you cry. Sorry. Not, not gay. You know, you mentioned my Uncle Bill. It's, it's going to bring me to tears each and every time. Hansberry, you got something to say? Yeah, you know, um, I want to give a shout out to our friend Leanne. She gave us a shout out on her first podcast. She's got a new podcast, Leanne Sims. It's called "If This Bar Could Talk." Oh, great! And uh, it's she's interviewing local uh, bartenders or bartenders around Columbus, Ohio, and uh, they make a cocktail 
the first one they made a uh, a, a French seventy five. I never had the damn thing. It, delicious, it's delicious. Leanne's but a good lady. She's, she's great. Uh, she scored some guests for us here on on Whiskey Business. And uh, by all means, check out her podcast and for she, sure. And she gave us a shout out too. So Man, I, 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 I am I would absolutely yeah, more than happy reciprocate. to 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 reciprocate. But she with just it. one episode in. If if this bar could talk, find it you know on iTunes and whatever. Our guest bottle has been the Russell's Reserve Single Barrel, uh, specially uh, put together for the Columbus Italian Club to celebrate our 40th year. And your guest interviewer has been Attorney Bill Mattis. Um, who apparently has uh, a lot more to ask. So, yeah, until the next bottle, the next story, see ya. <laughs>